by uh, morning. Okay. Um, as you all know, we don't really have a comprehensive uh, national AD registry uh, at this point of time. Uh, in fact, we've really just started this up, uh, and we have decided to call this our uh, ready, uh, the registry for AD integration. The, the reason and the background behind calling it ready instead of calling it PAD is that um, in my ministry, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, PAD means Public Affairs Department. So after six months of causing so much confusion, we kept saying it's PAD and then the Public Affairs guys will show up at the meeting. We said, okay, enough, let's just call it the AD, alright? And <clears throat> after a lot, things were a lot smoother. So that, that was the background behind why we called this uh, ready instead of something that had a PAD inside. All right. Yeah. So essentially, what we're trying to do uh, locally, and we are, uh, we are in the midst of starting this up, is that we're trying to create a comprehensive national ready registry. There are smaller registries today. The Singapore Heart Foundation has one. We've seen a few uh, small startups uh, done by various uh, interested individuals to uh, collect AD data. So, uh, about 1,000 different uh, AD lo uh, locations in two different databases each. And, um, sorry, one last thing is. Uh, yeah, so, um, what the name doesn't cover is the fact that we also want to create a national CPR trained person registry so that we can link the AD, the CPR person, to the site. Okay? So, this is a Singapore data. This is, I think, uh, 2012. But actually, this last year, we had 1,800 cardiac arrests already. Uh, numbers are very similar to Taiwan in terms of magnitude. Uh, about 2, two plus percent uh, survival rate, and we know that survival rate drops about 10% every minute. Okay? So, uh, in summary, okay, I think I'm studying all data on my uh, Taiwan stats. Uh, thank you for copying uh, correctly. Uh, but what, what we know is that uh, our witness survival rates are still fairly low, it's only about 12 percent. And from our local data, we've shown that bystander CPR actually improves uh, survival by uh, two times, right? And um, unfortunately, only 20 percent of our cases really get any bystander CPR, so this is a big gap for us. Yeah? Uh, public AEDs, we have a small uh, number of cases that are still using public AEDs, but we've shown that actually when they're defibrillated with a public AD, the odds of survival actually goes up more than 10. It's actually very, very significant. But of course, my caveat to this is that our numbers are small, so there's a lot of statistical variation. Perhaps uh, if you get more numbers, this number will probably shrink a little bit, but we know it's still going to be very high. Alright? And this is the unfortunate truth about our cases. Only 1% gets shot by a, a public AD. So it's not very good. Um, so what does an AD need, uh, you know, why do you need an AD, sorry, in this case? So essentially, you do need to have a registry so that you know where these uh, ADs are. And uh, we know that, let's say for example, from the cash registry, roughly, okay, 4% of the cases in the US actually get a PAD uh, to shock the patient. So at least that's uh, what some of the data seems to say. Uh, ADs also need maintenance and accurate data allows you to project where else uh, you need to put your AEDs. Of course, the cardiac arrest cases, uh, you need to overlay that with the AED data, then you see where your gaps are. And that makes it more cost effective and more efficient. Okay? So this is uh, probably my one and only uh, paper data slide, I think. Okay? So this is a paper that was put up in the New England Journal and uh, done by Tito Mura. It's a very, <coughs> very nice paper showing that uh, with uh, PADs, right, Okay, I'll summarize what they show. Actually, in in their uh, setting, 6% actually had uh, public access information. So we know from our 1%, we can actually increase this by 5 to 6 times if possible. All right? So in terms of survival with good outcomes, the ones we, which had uh, public access information, the outcomes of uh, 5 as good as uh, the yes. And when the ADs were increased, and we had, uh, they showed that when we had more than 4 ADs per square kilometer, uh, the time to shop dropped quite significantly, and the survival uh, rates actually went up almost three, four times. So, our goals, right, essentially, we do need to cover a few areas. One is to educate people on the simplicity, and, <clears throat> um, and we know that a lot of the stuff that we do, right, essentially is centered on community, right? Because, uh, you know, recognizing cardiac arrest, uh, 
getting the vice center to start CPR, getting the early preparation, all this is actually very heavily centered on community. I think this is the thing that we don't do so well locally. All right? And the challenges uh, that we face is actually one is that there are, there are very few, there are no uh, public uh, kind of arrest uh, TV campaigns, news campaigns, and stuff like that. And uh, as we mentioned, CPR rates, uh, public ADs, where are they, as well as our uh, fairly congested world. So response times for the formal EMS system is still challenging. Okay. This is Joe. He's about to have a cardiac arrest. <laughs> and save his life. Will you notice the signs? The first sign is straightforward. Joe collapses. He's unresponsive. His body limp. Now this is the part where it gets tricky. You see, this isn't breathing. Nowhere near close. The lungs are gasping for air, but they can't get to it. The heart has stopped. The brain is trying to breathe. He needs CPR. The last sign? The skin will change from pink to blue, and finally turn cold and grey. <coughs> this is Joe. He's just had a cardiac arrest. The question is, did you notice? Yeah. So this is very nice. Did you see this happen? Like Call 999 and start CPR as soon as possible. So this is a very nice uh, one-minute snippet from the British Heart Foundation, and they sponsored this campaign. And I realized that locally, even when we talk about teaching in CPR classes and BCLS classes, there's very little recognition of what agonal breathing is. And in fact, if you look at some of the old training uh, that people had, they would say, wait until breathing has stopped before you start CPR, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So essentially, we really do need to see how we can do this. And often, you know, uh, very cynically what government says, do more or less, right? Um, and, we, and I feel that it's true, we, we probably can do a lot more, uh, maybe not with less, but we definitely can do a lot more. Uh, so the areas I look at is really look at awareness, training, standards, technology, and also research, okay? So how do you raise awareness? Okay, so we've been going on uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, sometimes overtly, sometimes covertly, uh, sneaking our CPR agenda. So this is the Survivor Award, this is uh, some placements on telling people to watch this factor CPR uh, and also some of this is done by Sports Council as well as, uh, okay, that's me uh, as a bystander uh, doing CPR, that was my Survivor three months later and uh, yeah, we managed to get Channel News Asia to feature something as well to talk about the cardiac arrest as well as uh, response time and even in the army camps there are 1,900 ADs uh, just recently installed so yeah, uh, we've been uh, you know trying to socialize some of these ideas uh, through the media in various ways. Okay, mapping AEDs. Okay, we look at it as a multi-pronged approach because honestly, I don't think there's any one single approach that can uh, that will work. So some of it includes uh, regulation, uh, talking to the health science authority to include some requirement for reporting, tackle at source like distributors, building owners, getting the government involved. Let's say looking at building audits and then uh, volunteers, so uh, I think it's probably a combination of this that really makes the registry robust. And how do you increase the public usage? So you want to make the training much uh, much easier, uh, kid friendly, you want to target uh, children at a very young age, and these are some uh, systems which uh, you know, are used in Japan. Very nice, very kid friendly, uh, you know, so it's not scary for people. Yeah? And standards, okay, so you can see there's a whole bunch of different things uh, people use, there's a, you know, you can see there's an AEJ sign, and then someone puts up an AED sign that says heart attack, which uh, I, that makes no sense to me. And for example, you look at how many steps to save a life. One says seven steps, one says two. So there's no standardization. And this, this big center one that I put here was actually taken for more. To be used by authorized personnel approved by more management. That means none of you. None of you are approved to use it. So don't expect to pluck it off the wall if you really believe that. Right? Yeah, so increase awareness of location. So, you know, the way I look at it is that how do you find them and how do you make sure that they are, they are you know, good uh, ADs or other ADs that are visible in the right places. I take an example from this thing called Hungry Go Where, and then, you know, people rate like how good is the food. We want people to eventually rate how good is the AED, yeah? And of course, uh, you find it and then you give it a rating. This is a one star AED, you know, it sucks, the location comes down. Or, you know, it's in the box, you can't take it out. So, yeah, this is Paul's point, and actually we're looking at developing a local app that does a similar function uh, and very local. 
when we do the laws and the laws and all. Yeah, so this is our, our, our rough strategy. Essentially, we're looking at um, looking at uh, building up the data, uh, building the public AD database, helping bystanders, uh, you know, uh, do the CPR, coach them through, and then also creating a network uh, for rescuers so that we register these guys and we can summon them to the case. Um, the other thing we're looking at is this thing called gamification. Essentially, we're trying to turn this kind of activity. It's just like uh, you have Nike Plus, and you know, you make running into like a social thing. People help each other. You know, I, I challenge you, you challenge me. So we're trying to use a game concept to make AD finding uh, fun, so that people can play games. You get badges, points, leaderboards. You know. So for example, you go to an area, geolocation tells uh, you that your friend has been here. They found five AEDs in ten minutes. Can you do better? So it helps you go there, look for the AEDs, and it summarizes you to where the AEDs are when you really need to do it. By the way, if you're interested, there's a free course on Coursera by the Walton Business School. You can actually do it online for free, it's like 10 weeks worth. But it teaches you how to design apps uh, with a game-like interface so that people can get on board easily and can play it as if it's a game. And actually, you're doing something serious to help people verify AEDs. So these are some of the things that we are planning. Um, okay, so of course, uh, this is some of the daily fight sort of stuff. You know, AED bike hunts, you locate AED, my heart map challenge. So these are some of the approaches that we've seen in real world, and then we are also moving in this direction. Yeah. So, and then this is the one where you get people to design uh, AED signages, cool posters, and stuff like that. <coughs> so essentially, what we're trying to do with this whole mobile app approach is that essentially, uh, you know, when someone has a cardiac arrest, the dispatcher helps to coach the bystander, uh, you know, the app or, not, or the, the dispatch center recruits additional rescuers by, uh, you know, those who have a mobile app. And then uh, we get the CPR trained persons to come in and then help provide better CPR, train the AD quicker, and hopefully that brings uh, to a better outcome. Yeah? So ultimately what we also want to do in uh, the last part of the approach is research. Essentially, you want to know where's the cardiac arrest, and you try and draw a heat map, overlay, you know, and then so that you can try and see where the gaps and then find the areas where you're gonna uh, put more AEDs or propose to people to, to fix that. And lastly, standards, okay, and this is really just a quick picture show. So this is um, a mall management that's kind of embarrassed about the AED, so it's hidden it all the way right in the corner. Right? Uh, well, but to be fair to them, they put a signage to say it's right in the corner. Yeah? So this is another one. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, we saw this just now. Okay. And, yeah, this is uh, sent by a friend, uh, AD, which is kind of maybe for NBA basketball players. <laughs> but, uh, but not, not regular folk like us. And, okay, this is contributed uh, by my Indonesian colleague, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ali Haida. Uh, this is uh, AD. And this is unfortunately a similar circumstance uh, locally in uh, one of our tourist attractions. Uh, they have since uh, uh, replaced it. Okay, and then this is the final slide I have. Basically, uh, we just signed a, a memorandum of understanding with an NGO because essentially this is a community effort and government does not want to be seen uh, owning every single thing, including uh, community response. So we do need a community partner to help us <coughs> this, socialize this with the public. So this is really something the community needs to own. We will own the formal EMS system, but we'll partner them and do this work together. And we hope that everyone will be ready. So if any questions, uh, if you can ask now. If not, you can always just drop me an email uh, or to the ready email. And hopefully you'll see uh, a nice website up in a few months' time. We are already planning that. Thank you.